Hello, dear friends, and welcome back to my channel. I have an interesting story for you today. Interesting because it is different than what I normally write. So I've kind of been playing around with this story, and it's a historical romance. Um, it's a short story, so it shouldn't take you that long to watch or and listen. And um, it's based in Boston in 1876. And I picked Boston because my friend Stephanie Fowers and I had done a research trip there a year ago, January, and we had such an amazing time. At the time, I have a whole other book series in mind, but this one just kind of popped in and I wanted to play with it. And so I know it's not what I normally write. It's not norm It's not contemporary romance, but I wanted to share it with you and I would love to get your thoughts on it. So take a listen and I'll see you on the other side. Chapter one. The early morning sunlight filtered through the windows of my quaint bookshop, Seaside Pages, casting a warm glow on the rows of bookshelves I'd meticulously organized over the years. I hummed softly to myself while shelving a stack of nautical histories, tracing my fingers over the embossed titles of tomes that felt like old friends. As Boston's dedicated bookkeeper and shop owner, I loved surrounding myself with adventures bound in leather and ink. My chestnut waves tumbled over my shoulders as I worked, complementing my modest emerald dress. I kept up a graceful exterior as my friend and frequent customer, Tabitha, browsed the new releases nearby. But I harbored an underlying melancholy because the most romantic part of my day included selling books full of dashing men sweeping women off their feet. Did those gardening books arrive yet? Tabitha asked. I'm hoping to find inspiration for my yard. I smiled faintly. Tabitha longed for love and marriage as much as I did, but neither of us had found it in this seaside town. While I contented myself within the rustling pages, she took her frustrations out on the cottage she renovated. Not yet, but soon. I'll let you know. As I assisted another browser, Tabitha mentioned a friend's recent engagement. She's only 19, I protested. My tension must have shown, because she gave me a sympathetic frown. 19 and counting. She lifted a finger in the air. I harumphed and went back to alphabetizing. Organization never let me down. I'm off. She stepped to the door and stopped abruptly. Whipping a thick envelope out of her purse, she flourished it at me. Your invitation to the governor's ball, my dear. Cinderella, Cinderella, I murmured as I accepted. As in years past, I would not attend. No need to tell Tabitha that, though. She'd only pester me about the dress I could wear or the fun it would be to discuss literature with the wealthy residents who loved to read by the light of their own conceit. Was it so wrong of me to enjoy a good dime store novel now and then? According to the local elite males, yes. They didn't know their wives frequented my shop for stories of pirates and marauders, and I wasn't going to be the one to tell them. A quick goodbye, I saw Tabitha out. Alone again, I released a breath. As long as I was surrounded by tales of adventure, I could ignore the ever-present heartache associated with love and loss. The shop was mine by default of death. My father started it, along with the printing business that I'd had to sell to pay his debts. The proceeds from selling the press allowed me to keep the shop and the small apartment above which provided independence few women knew in this age. The bell above my shop door jingled, heralding the arrival of a stranger. I turned from reshelving nautical almanacs to study the rugged newcomer. Faded navy jacket, rolled sleeves exposing corded forearms, skin touched golden by the sun, all evidence of a seafaring life. The scent of salt and adventure trailed him into my sanctuary of ink and vellum. My pulse fluttered without my consent. Ignoring it, I stepped forward with a polite smile. There was no need to simper in the handsome man's wake. Welcome to Seaside Pages. Can I help you find anything specific today? The stranger met my gaze directly. In the shadow of his battered captain's hat, eyes glinted sharp as sapphires. I hope so, he said. I'm seeking a rare maritime survey, the first edition of King's Exploration of the Patagonian Channels from 1832. It contains unique hand-drawn maps and plates rendering the voyage. 
I blinked, unexpected yearning briefly, tugging my focus southwards, towards open waters. With effort, I recentered my wayward thoughts. The Patagonian channels, I repeated. By King. I believe my collection includes a few additions, perhaps even some original logs. One moment. My small maritime section occupied three packed shelves near the back, meticulously organized despite its diminutive size. I trailed fingers across the worn spines, pausing at gaps where sought-after additions had found new homes. The stranger paced the narrow aisle behind me, muted impatience evidenced by occasional glances at the nearby harbor visible through my shop windows. But the supple leather binding I saw eluded me. I turned to him with an apology on my lips. I'm sorry, I don't seem to have the 1832 edition in stock. But I can order a quality reproduction. I've invested considerable time seeking out an original, he interjected. Modern reprints fail to capture nuances of the hand-drawn maps. I studied ink stains lining his blunt fingers, evidence of his own cartographic efforts, perhaps? Sympathy stirred at his dogged pursuit. You clearly understand the significance. I sincerely wish I possessed a copy for you. He eyed the crowded bookshelves as though an original might materialize through tenacity alone. Finally, rocking back on his heels, a reluctant grin teased one corner of his well-formed mouth. Well, I appreciate you double-checking, miss. Thompson, I supplied. Alice Thompson. Rough fingers enveloped mine in a brisk handshake. Captain Jack Rhodes. A pleasure. His grip lingered a moment, a callous thumb tracing my knuckles. I suppressed a shiver. I'll be shipping out before dawn tomorrow. But next time I'm in port, I'll stop again in case you uncover that blasted survey. One dark brow quirked as he added, a woman as organized and dedicated as yourself might succeed where others have failed. I found myself returning his fleeting smile with surprising sincerity. Fair winds to you then, Jack Rhodes. I wish you a safe and rewarding voyage. He touched two fingers to his hat's worn brim in casual salute. And to you as well, Alice Thompson. Until we meet again. The door swung shut in his wake, bell chiming merrily. I stared at worn oaken planks where moments before they'd borne his restless tread, and wondered why melancholy now shadowed the familiar comfort of my shop. Chapter 2 Though I worked to school myself and my newfound interest in watching for Jack's ship's return, I failed miserably. The captain had awakened a curiosity inside of me, a stirring so deep that I had been able to ignore it for years. As it surged to the surface, it brought strange thoughts, hopes and desires that left me near the peak of joy only to dash me to the depths of reality. I could not get his wicked grin out of my mind nor the roguish glint in his eye out of my imagination. A man such as he was not uncommon in this town, though they rarely ventured into my store. Perhaps that is what brought me to long periods of musing over Captain Rhodes. A well read sailor was was rare as a pearl. I kept sporadic watch on the ships as they drifted in and out of Boston's modest harbor over subsequent weeks. I walked along the harbor path in the late afternoon sun, listening to the tall tales told by men who were ready for a drink and a hammock. From what I gathered, sailors preferred their bed to rock with the waves, but when on land, they would settle for a swath like a mother's gentle gait. Unfortunately for me, the tales told of Captain Rhodes were not the type that brought solace to my wandering heart. It seemed Jack Rhodes was well known amongst the port shipping community, a capable captain often employed to navigate dangerous or uncharted routes. His crew respected his relentless work ethic and smooth competence even amidst perilous conditions. Yet the same qualities fueling his professional success apparently wreaked havoc in his personal affairs. If local gossip proved true, Rhodes left broken hearts strewn across countless ports, with no shortage of feminine admirers, despite his careless charm. Of course women love him, I complained to Tabitha one afternoon as we walked arm in arm among the shops. He's tall, has a full head of wonderful wavy hair, blue eyes that dance like the wind, and shoulders to carry all of life's burdens away with him to see. I sighed, heavily. Have we fallen into unrequited love, my friend? Tabitha tugged me toward the hat shop window. Margaret worked to arrange her new creations for display. 
Light pinks and blues were in favor and she'd outdone herself with dried roses from last summer's garden. Her ability to foresee trends was admirable and her single stature as much of a curiosity as mine and Tabitha's. Margaret waved cheerily from inside. It cannot be love. I haven't so much as laid eyes on the captain in weeks. I almost sighed again but was able to gulp it back to keep from encouraging Tabitha's thought process. It's likely he's forgotten our brief interaction amidst concerns of ship maintenance and charting courses through the passage. Oh. She leaned down to consider a smaller hat with a blue ribbon. I always thought time at sea made a man lonely for female company. Tabitha. I gasped as I glanced at the preacher's wife bustling past us. Do keep your thoughts out of the outhouse, I leaned closer and widened my eyes, at least while we're in public. We dissolved into giggles. The two of us were church-going ladies with reputations to uphold. Though, in private, we were modern women who rarely kept our ankles covered and trooped about our own apartments in little more than our shifts. As brazen as I was within the walls of my own home, I understood all too well that my place in society, a female business owner, could topple at the first sign of scandal. Still, I couldn't deny an unwelcome pinch whenever a sailor shared Captain Jack Rhodes' latest female conquest. Nor temper the flare of relief on hearing he'd soon depart to risk the treacherous Drake passage yet again. My traitorous thoughts snarled tighter than sailors' knots. I had no claim on the sailors' attention. If other women wished to fawn and moon without consideration for propriety or their own self-worth, what right had I to judge? When Rhodes' ship next hove into port some weeks later, I endured a sharper pang when he didn't come directly to my shop. Nor did he visit over the next two days. I brusquely repelled Tabitha's efforts to buoy my inexplicable moodiness with jovial chatter of tea. I should feel nothing but professional respect for Jack Rhodes, and perhaps casual gratitude for brightening otherwise mundane days with intriguing gossip. That I alternated between irrational disappointment and equally irrational jealousy every time someone about town brought him up, proved extremely vexing. As did the leap of my pulse when a string of stormy days culminated in Jack Road striding into my sanctuary late one Friday afternoon. I struggled to maintain a polite mask, nodding coolly to the sailor now leaning an elbow on my counter as rain pattered against window glass behind him. Back to try your luck finding that survey? I inquired. I would not fool myself into thinking he was here to see me. Our time together had been short and a near month had passed since. One corner of his mouth lifted as his gaze dashed over my figure. Fortune occasionally smiles on me. His low voice sent an unwelcome tingle down my spine. Have the fates delivered King's writing into your capable hands and beautiful hands? I shook my head, inexplicably disappointed to dash his hope. Before I could frame another useless apology, lightning split the sky, thunder rumbling quick on its heels making me jump and grab onto the edge of the counter. Jack glanced outside with a muttered oath. Appears I've overstayed my welcome. The storm's churning the blasted harbor. I joined him scanning the white-capped swells. Slate-gray clouds blurred the horizon so completely that it seemed we perched on the edge of nothing. The deluge drowned the bells booing the harbor mouth, their warning clang inaudible over wind and rain. Another ice-searing bolt had Jack declaring, I'd best make for the pier before tornadoes gather. Your book trove might weather such tempests admirably, Alice, but I doubt my sea legs will serve as well on land. He flipped his oilskin collar up and yanked the door wide, cold air blasting us both. Rather than dashing into the storm as expected, he turned on the threshold. You should lock this place up tight once I'm away. Don't want your collection damaged. His gaze tracked around my snug domain, creases lining his weathered brow. Was that concern lurking in his cerulean depths? You'll batten down safely here alone? I bristled at the implication, the presumption that I required masculine protection from the weather, even as an unfamiliar warmth kindled in my core. I've endured such storms before without issue, I assured crisply. Rallying to soften my response, I added, but I appreciate your concern Captain Rhodes. I maintained the use of his proper name even if he'd stepped into the unforbidden, though not unwelcome, realm of using my given name, without permission. 
Now get yourself safely back to that fine ship before this tempest sweeps you away to Atlantis. Amusement crinkled the skin beside his eyes. Never made it to Atlantis myself. But the way this wind's tearing, I might discover it soon. He touched two fingers to his hat's brim in familiar salute. Stay staunch, Miss Thompson. We'll speak again. He plunged into the downpour while I fastened shutters blocking out what little light the sun was able to punch through the bruised dark sky. The storm's ferocity throughout the day and into the evening made peace impossible, driving me to pace between shelves, tidying non-existent clutter. If I'd thought myself distracted by Captain Rhodes before, I was daftly mistaken. For now every bolt of lightning and every boom of thunder sent my heart racing and a prayer to heaven for his safety. How did it fare along the harbor I wondered. The ships moored there would be severely tested with wind and waves likely dashing smaller vessels against piers like children's toys. I frowned at the macabre thought. Sailors constantly confronted elemental tantrums. Surely most secured protective measures before full fury struck. Captain Rhodes certainly qualified as seasoned enough to guard his interests from predictable hazards. So why did Azure eyes clouded with concern linger so distinctly in my mind and keep me from settling? Normally a storm such as this was welcomed as it provided a respite from work and the opportunity to reacquaint myself with a good novel. But this one left me off kilter. Gradually the thunder marching throughout the streets faded. The rain yet fell steadily, obscuring lingering daylight, muting familiar sounds of a harbor restlessly working to batten down. I prepared to lock up for the night when movement at my door startled me. Had Rhodes returned? I waited with bated breath, knowing full well it could be Tabitha or the preacher come to check on me. I unlocked the latch and the wind pushed open the door, nearly dragging me with it. I stared up into Captain Rhodes' rain-soaked face. Anxiety brewed in those stormy eyes. There you are, lass. One large hand pushed back his dripping hat, raking the other through his hair before gesturing sharply. It's chaos on the waterfront. Debris everywhere, a right mess. I had to see your shop's condition. He drew an audible breath, tension fading from his frame. Road scanned windows and rafters, clearly seeking structural issues rather than meeting my gaze. I told you I'd be fine in here. I stepped to the counter and retrieved a towel I had stuffed there earlier in case the window casing leaked. I, you appear intact, praise be. His shoulders remained knotted with residual concern for my safety. Instead of trying to brush him off, I stepped aside, murmuring, come in and dry off, Captain. The storm's not relenting any time soon. He eyed my proffered towel dubiously, water pooling on my shop-worn floor planks. I shouldn't intrude on you lass. Your shop is a haven I daren't spoil. Exasperated fondness overtook me. I took his sleeve and gently tugged. Boston and this shop stood two decades before either of us sailed in. My shop won't crumble after a single gale. But if you insist on checking on damsels you perceive are in distress, at least take a moment to get warm. Thunder groaned through straining rafters as if underscoring my words. Jack's eyes crinkled, a wry twist to his lips. Well then. It seems churlish to ignore a lady's gracious invitation. He accepted the towel, scrubbing gingerly at rain-darkened hair. Even observing mundane actions like him drying his hair stirred a longing inside me to reach out and skim my fingers through the weighty strands. Despite my mind warning that nothing could come of it, my heart quickened at his nearness and the rich laughter lurking in his eyes. Shucking his coat, Jack draped both items near the small stove housing a few coals. I busied myself stoking the flames and adding two logs to the fire, acutely aware of his imposing frame dominating the room. It was ridiculous to feel this unbalanced by his proximity. I knew every shelf, each book like familiar friends. Yet disruptive awareness of him hummed along my nerves. Fetching a worn blanket, I offered it wordlessly. He accepted with grave courtesy, wrapping the ragged wool about his broad shoulders. I spied color seeping back into his rugged features and affection swelled unrestrained behind my ribs. I ducked my head rather than reveal such naked vulnerability. But the gesture left no retreat from his soft query. 
Thank you. How do you fare then, lass? Cold? His rough voice held warmer notes than whined still screeching outside. Their tender resonance left me shaken, fixed on the soft glow lining his face. Surely he noticed my two quick breaths. I managed something near my customary poise, despite the inner turmoil. Tolerably well, Captain, under the circumstances. His answering rumble teased my ear. Just tolerable then? We must improve on that. Long fingers reached to adjust his makeshift blanket cloak so that it went around my shoulders as well. His warmth bled through the faded fabric, searing my arm beneath his featherlight touch. I cannot in good conscience leave a lady merely tolerable, he continued solemnly, though silver glinted in his eyes. Please inform me if your condition shifts towards the perilous. Then I shall muster all gentlemanly efforts towards restoration. A surprised chuckle escaped me. Such diligence for a humble shopkeeper's welfare? Beware overly taxing your chivalry Captain Rhodes, lest you strain something. The impropriety of the moment was not lost on me nor on the loud beat of my heart against my ribcage, though I was powerless to step out of the circle of warmth. Never you fear. One wayward lock fell across his temple when he shook his head, stealing my breath anew. I'll gladly endure any hazard on your behalf. Silence held us bound, his playful mood fading as searching eyes traced my face. I stood enthralled by the unexpected intimacy, fearing movement might shatter the peculiar spell settling around us. The sound of a warning bell broke through the silence. Awareness of the situation he'd placed me in, should anyone venture inside the shop for shelter or perchance a book, broke across Jack's expression, and he shifted back a pace. Apologies. I've overtaxed your patience as well as your hospitality. You've done no such thing, I blurted like an unschooled child. The sharp denial felt rested from some hollow place behind my ribs. I moderated my tone at his startled look. Truly, I appreciate the company more than I can say. I gestured helplessly to the shadowed recesses of my sanctuary where whimsy suddenly couldn't reach. Time often weighs lonely here. But now, I risked meeting his eyes. For the moment at least, the world feels less empty. My own daring left me breathless. I never spoke of being alone, not wanting to draw attention to my spinster state nor the precariousness of running a business in a town full of rough sailors and unscrupulous men. But candor is often bred by encroaching nightfall. And I couldn't deny the truth any longer, Jack's presence filled spaces left hollow too long. Maybe he read the confession in my unguarded eyes. For suddenly his expression gentled, as he again closed the gap between us. My lips parted soundlessly. But speech became unnecessary as Jack cradled my face between his hands. The caress seared through me, branding all remaining protests meaningless. You captivate me, Alice Thompson. Raw sincerity resonated in his hushed voice. From the first moment I saw you. My lonely siren, finding solace here among treasures of forgotten shores. His callous thumb traced my lower lip, drawing a helpless gasp. Curse the gossip mongers and wagging tongues who would see my life undone by a kiss. I wanted to feel his lips, to surrender to his kiss. Might a weary sailor petition for a taste of such sweetness before sailing for stranger harbors? My trembling fingers covered his where they bracketed my thundering pulse. Yet I held his simmering gaze unflinching. You need not ever ask, Jack Rhodes. A growled curse preceded his mouth sealing fiercely over mine. And the storm fell away forgotten. Chapter 3 Dawn's rosy hue filtered through the bookshop's salt-streaked windows, lining Jack's rugged features while he yet slumbered. He'd kissed me good and long, branding my soul with his mark. I would never be the same again. A kiss could do that to a woman. Perhaps that's why giving in to such temptations was considered a sin. What would the old women say about spending the night by the fire, talking to a sea captain without a chaperone and then falling asleep with my head on his chest, listening to his strong heartbeat? I didn't have to ponder too long before my cheeks blushed at the very thought of their scornful words. I studied the sinewy sailor, memorizing beloved lines usually masked beneath good-humored bluster. 
What sorcery allowed this transient captain to unlock my guarded heart? Like the sea breezes swirling outside, he stirred long dormant longings, both exhilarating and frightening in their intensity. I'd long since surrendered to a lonely life, but the hope that there may be more on my horizon had brought me to this teetering state where what was strong and stable for so long, my shop and my reputation, could no longer hold me up. Though I dare say those who would have me tossed into the street would be severely disappointed in the topic of conversation we enjoyed last night. Books. Stories. Poets. Jack's knowledge was deep and his interest keen. Not only did he keep up on the changing political tides that washed over this nation, he'd studied philosophers and theology at his father's knee. Bless that man for loving his child enough to read to him. I believe our fathers would have gotten along keenly. Which made my current predicament, namely, Jack's arm tucked about me and my cheek on his chest all the more alarming. What would my father say? I shifted to rise without waking my partner in crime but sharp eyes slid open, cerulean depths tender with affection. Fleeing already, my heart? Jack's smile held untroubled joy. Daybreak grants us further stolen hours together. I relaxed into his loose embrace, traces of doubt vanishing. Rarely have I felt such contentment, Captain. Yet how long can a sailor deny his mistress, the sea? My fingertip traced the corded sinews of his forearm. She always reclaims her own in the end. Jack's crystal gaze darkened. My life has been ruled by capricious winds and tides. But know that I'll strive with every shred of skill to safely return to your harbor, Alice. He dragged his knuckles along my jaw, rough voice husky. Stay constant as the North Star and I shall ever fix my course by your heavenly light. I rested my head against his chest, my worries over tomorrow and the tide of gossip that was sure to flood my safe harbor were not lulled by his steady heartbeat as we spoke of my late father, once a sailor himself. When I confessed old fears of losing those I loved to the pitiless waves, Jack cradled me close. The past can't fetter us unless we allow it, lass. My only oath is that you'll never stand forlornly scanning the empty sea for my distant sail. He kissed the top of my hair, voice weighted with conviction. I swear this haven shall ever remain yours safe and true. You can promise no such thing. I pecked a kiss to his cheek and pushed myself to standing. The cold air, cleansed by the storm the night before, hit me and I moved to add wood to the stove. Jack beat me there, his large hand stilling mine. Do you condemn me then for the ungovernable sea being my mistress, Alice? For you are my love, my heart, though she calls to me still. I flinched, fighting years of deeply rooted fears. He would never understand and I could not express the depths of my sorrow nor the breadth of my fears. I lifted my chin. Nay, I just cannot bear the thought of losing your affection to the wave's fickle mercy. My cowardice shamed me, but old wounds, crippled tongue and spirit alike. Fickle, you doubt my declarations? I bit the inside of my cheek all at once hating myself. I. The stories of your conquests proceed you from port to port. It is no different here. I glanced at the floor as his hand fell away. Alice, he whispered my name. I wouldn't, couldn't look at him. Not only had I shamefully kept my true fears buried deep like a cursed treasure no sailor wants to find, I accused him of the most dastardly deeds and of treating me like a common woman who traded an evening of affection for money. Jack scraped a hand over his weathered face, tension in the cords of his neck. This air between us has turned sour. I'll remove myself before either of us says more to harm. May calmer winds bless whatever quarrel lies between us. He touched his cap and exited without another word. In the resounding quiet, I berated myself for arrogant assumptions and groundless injury inflicted upon my captain's stalwart heart. What right had I to condemn Jack? Thus provoking his withdrawal, small wonder he now doubted the sincerity of my regard. I hugged my arms to my trembling body. The past shaking my frame without Jack's warmth to hold it at bay. Chapter 4 in the lonely days that followed, I wrestled with remorse and doubt. I wrote Jack many letters bearing my lingering fears so we might reconcile them when fate allowed. But shame always stayed my hand before the post. 
He was only a few steps from my door, but seemed miles away. Jack occupied his ship rather than my company, despite attempts to engage him along the bustling waterfront. Had he surrendered himself wholly to the sea's transient embrace now, believing it able to satisfy what fragile bonds we shared? He set sail the next morning, staring out to sea as if she held the answers to life's great queries. As I watched his ship slip away, I longed to do the same with my bookshop and yet found the pages that once fed my soul dry and cracked. An interesting passage would only fan the desire to share it with my sea captain and leave me aching with longing. Dearest Tabitha alone knew the depth of longing in my heart. With customary wisdom, her patient counsel bade me not abandon hope that wounds between Jack and I might yet mend. My pride had steered us awry, I confessed with fresh remorse. Ever compassionate Tabitha heard each pang of regret until the tempest began calming at last. Anchoring to one another despite uncertain seas has seen many ships brave out storms impossible to weather through solitude, my friend, she told me. Her gentle words nourished courage within my soul to try again. When his ship finally sailed into port, I could barely contain my nerves. They insisted on jumping under my skin and causing me to drop books at the most inopportune times. I managed to stay myself and keep to my shop until closing time, flittering past the window to observe the crew unload their wares. The harbormaster checked the log books and then shook hands with my captain. For yes, he was still mine in my heart. Fastening my short jacket, I closed the shop and made my way to the waterfront. Many of the sailors made for one of the pubs and Jack had gone that direction. Several of the establishments were of lower report and I was grateful to find him at Liberty's Alehouse, where those who considered themselves gentlemen flocked for a bowl of clam chowder and fresh biscuits after a short or long stretch at sea. My appearance at the door didn't bring much attention from the patrons. The swish of skirts was common enough among these men who had families in other ports. The bar stretched along the back wall and men who didn't want to talk stared into their ale with an air of loneliness about them. The dark walls sported animal heads, prizes from days long gone that stared through empty eyes at those who emptied glasses. Several sailors played a spirited game of darts in the corner, their bluster louder than a gale storm though their aim was much better. Jack sat alone at a table, his back hunched and his food half-eaten. He dipped his spoon in the chowder and watched it drop away. Quelling riotous heartbeats, I approached with quiet footsteps and a hopeful heart. I stopped near Jack's chair and when he didn't look up, I delicately cleared my throat. At the sound, Jack raises his eyes to meet mine, his stormy blue depths filled with banked longing and desire before he swiftly masks such telling emotion behind a facade of cool propriety. He made no move to invite me to sit beside him. Instead he stood abruptly, sweeping up his faded captain's hat from the table and holding it before him like a shield. Miss Thomas, he greeted me with a formal distance that was like ice on the top of a water bucket, sharp and hard. At his words, my hopeful heart sinks as though it had been dashed upon the reefs. Am I to be Miss Thomas to you now? I ask, my voice tremulous. Unbidden, vivid memories of our moonlit kiss among the silent tombs on my bookshelves filled the sudden space between us, bringing a flush of warmth to my cheeks. Jack's eyes dim with echoing regret. I, miss. Tis, proper, he replied tonelessly. I silently railed that I would gladly cast what society deems proper behavior into Boston's cold waters if only I could throw myself unrestrained into his strong embrace instead. I ventured tentatively, I had hoped we might converse a while. Perhaps, take a turn about the harbor walk? I had no desire to lay my soul bare before the pub's patrons. But Jack only settled his hat firmly atop his head, tugging the brim low, as if to shadow his conflicted gaze. My apologies, Miss Thompson, but duty calls at the shipwrights this eve. As a captain, there is no rest for the harried, eh? And with that, he turned upon his heel and strode briskly away without a backwards glance, leaving me standing bereft and alone amidst the cheer and chatter of Liberty's alehouse, blinking back fruitless tears. There's nothing left to do, I muttered as I followed his path through the tables and out the door. I chased after the man and came up with empty hands. Some fisherman I was. The sun sank over the land, casting the waters in a golden hue. No wonder they called to the sailor, promises of gold on every wave. Oh Jack, I whispered into the light breeze. 
Why must you still armor yourself against me thus? Time was said to heal even the deepest of wounds. My careless words and thoughtless accusations had risen from an age-old pain that wounded tender shoots of affection between us. One evening, one kiss, one night, and I was besotten. It seemed my sharp tongue had cost the one chance at love I would have in this life. O oh Lord, would that I could be wiser in the moment and braver in the face of love. I walked slowly down the lane towards my beloved seaside pages, lost in bittersweet memories of Jack and all that I had lost in a moment of carelessness. The evening sunlight filtering through the display window cast the familiar interior in a warm glow, welcoming me home. As I reached to open the blue-painted door, a sudden shadow fell across my shoulder and made me gasp and spin around. There before me stood Jack, travel-stained but still striking as ever. He ran an agitated hand through his wind-tousled dark hair. I tried, Miss Thomas. I tried to wash you from my heart, to drown the memory of you in the sea, he confessed urgently. But you are stronger than she. I clutched my hands to my chest in surprise of his admission when only a half hour before he'd run from my presence. Jack. Do not tease me this way, I pleaded, scarcely daring to hope. I speak the truth, he vowed, his stormy gaze boring into mine. My doubts warred with my longing. I'm scared to love you, Jack. Scared that you'll sail away one day and the sea will take you from me forever. But now I know I would suffer more never being able to kiss you again. I held my breath at this admission. In one swift move, Jack swept me inside the still open door of my shop and shut it firmly behind us. Trapping me gently against its solid oak planks, he lowered his head and took his time to relearn my lips, kissing me slowly and deeply, with a tenderness that set my knees to trembling. My hands curled into the fabric of his worn coat as I surrendered blissfully, no longer afraid. As the moment spun out around us, I knew the vast ocean herself could never rival the exhilarating promise I found in his arms. Chapter 5 As I took in the resplendence of the ballroom, the glow of Edison's electric lights in the chandelier astonished me. The new world was embracing modern inventions that hinted at extraordinary innovations to come. I gazed down at my emerald gown, hoping its sheen would meet with Jack's admiration. The grand ballroom glittered with an array of attendees in their finest evening dress. Ladies floated across the dance floor in gowns of shimmering silk and satin, belled sleeves and layered skirts swirling around them as they moved. Delicate fans waved coyly to catch the eyes of potential dance partners. Strings of pearls and gemstone necklaces adorned graceful throats, matching the sparkling chandelier overhead, the first of its kind. The gentlemen matched the ladies in polished style, clad in tailcoats and waistcoats, expertly knotted cravats at their throats. Their leather heels clicked smartly in time with the music as they led their partners through the graceful dance steps. Though some, I noted wryly, lacked grace themselves, relying on the ladies' skill to avoid trampling toes. Servants weaved expertly through the crowds bearing trays of refreshing drinks and ornate canapes. Their livery was as crisp and fine as any of the attendees, if lacking elaborate trimmings. Yet their lowered gazes and polite murmurs betrayed their true station beneath those they served. I wondered if anyone resented those whose shoes would never pinch and blister as theirs did night after night. It was a glamorous affair, all told, though the glittering surface perhaps concealed depths few considered. The one sour spot of the evening was Nigel. He'd often tried to court me and claimed that before his death my father had expressed a desire for us to be wed. I doubted every word from his serpent tongue, but that didn't stop him from admiring me in a way that had me wishing for the darkest corner of my bookshop to hide. My gaze strayed off into the oak doors, anxious for Jack's arrival and his steady, strong presence. He promised to attend this event and offer a vibrant contrast to my bookish mien though I knew it was outside of his usual haunts. Yet the appointed hour approached without any sign of my tardy captain. I rechecked my hairpins and composure. Unease gnawed my composure as neglectful minutes ticked by. The doors swept open, autumn air sighing inward. Backlit by moonlight stood a lone figure scanning the elegant crowd strong jaw captain's jacket framing a crisp shirt. Intensity radiated from him, magnetizing the very air. The man was strong and broad-shouldered, a foe no one would want to fight and yet in our stolen moments alone, he held me with such tenderness that I floated. 
Jack's brilliant eyes met mine. The other ladies whispered behind their feathered fans about the dashing newcomer. No doubt assuming he would corrupt a respectable lady such as myself in short order if given the chance. Wouldn't they be properly scandalized to know I wanted to give him that chance? Jack crossed the foyer swiftly and clasped my elbow gently. You'll forgive a delayed sailor starlight? His smile eased lingering tension. But not even Leviathan Rising could prevent me from attending you tonight. I exhaled tremulous relief, leaning into his offered support. This steadfast man would weather any foreign storm for my sake. And you are most welcome now, dearest Jack. Mischief danced in his gaze. Since pretty words fail, perhaps your nerves might settle better, with a kiss? Laughing agreement drew me close, even as I placed a hand on his chest. I created the proper distance between us, smiling. Jack's touch trailed the back of my hand. You leave me breathless in that gown, my darling. Beauty to inspire vow breaking indeed. My eyes darted to Nigel glowering from across the room. Nigel's presence tonight could only mean trouble. Since attending me tonight was Jack's declaration of his intent to court me properly, I worried over the outcome. I gently guided Jack away from Nigel's line of sight, mindful to maintain proper appearances. Though every fiber of my being wished to melt into Jack's embrace without care, some battles called for patience and discretion. I would safeguard the haven we built together, even from the likes of Nigel. Jack seemed to read my thoughts. His eyes clouded, but he kept his tone light. Oh come now, even old Nigel knows better than to tangle with a sea captain. I clasped Jack's hand tightly, hiding them behind my dress and then letting go just as quickly. With him beside me on uncertain seas, no challenge would prove insurmountable. Soon Jack mingled affably with patrons who flocked eagerly towards his magnetic presence. My unconventional escort enthralled all with vivid accounts of ventures abroad. Soon he mingled affably with patrons who flocked eagerly towards his magnetic presence. My unconventional escort enthralled all with vivid accounts of ventures abroad jewel bright isles rising from azure waves, vines cloaking ancient ruins, filing unfamiliar ears with wonder bound tighter than any book. Though polite distance stretched between us, Jack's admiring gaze conveyed silent messages undeterred by swirling crowds. Shared triumph warmed the space whenever our eyes met briefly across gilded chambers. One invisible golden thread binding us fast through the glittering whirl. I was no less sought after and hated by many a young maid who set her eye on Jack only to be politely rebuffed or ignored. He only had eyes for me which in turn made every other man suddenly look at me as if I'd appeared from a gilded lamp. My dance card was full and my feet ached. Never had I enjoyed so much attention nor wished it away at the same time. After a particularly harried waltz with an inexperienced partner that left my toes bruised, Jack stepped beside me, his steely gaze warding off any would-be partners. Their interest proves your true spirit starlight, bright as any beacon above drab surfaces. His searching look stripped further pretense away. I leaned into him gratefully. As you deduced, Captain. Their hunger to engage in dance and conversation pains me beyond bearing. I lifted one foot to give it some respite. As I rested against a pillar, I caught sight of Nigel Blythe watching me from across the ballroom. A small shiver went through me as our eyes met briefly. He had always made me feel uneasy, with his possessive gazes and implications that my father wished to see us married. I did my best to avoid his company. Nigel's eyes narrowed as he observed the easy camaraderie between myself and Jack. His jaw was tight with jealousy and displeasure. After a moment more of glowering in our direction, he began making his way through the crowd towards us. I tensed, gripping Jack's arm. Well now, if it isn't the prodigal Captain Davenport, back from another lengthy voyage, Nigel remarked as he joined us. His tone was falsely pleasant, his smile more a baring of teeth. Rumors abound regarding the cargo you carry on such risky journeys abroad. I wonder, do I spy a hint of silk peeking out from those broad shoulders? Jack met Nigel's gaze calmly, amusement crinkling the corners of his eyes. The only adornments I bear are words and whimsies from distant shores, mate, he replied lightly. But mayhap some silken phrases slipped into my speech from time abroad. 
I gather such fancies garner steep tariffs here in Boston. His clever response drew appreciative chuckles from nearby guests. Nigel's face flushed red with annoyance as he turned and strode angrily away. I released a breath I hadn't realized I was holding, relief coursing through me. Gazing up at Jack's grinning face, I couldn't help but grin in return, our shared victory igniting the space between us once more. Jack chuckled, steering us off to a stone terrace overlooking the sea for private reprieve from the ball's draining tide. We stood unspeaking there, his solid warmth warding the autumn chill at my back. Unknown horizons shimmered mysteriously ahead, faint stars guiding lone voyagers on timeless nocturnal quests. Eventually, Jack bent to murmur soft in my ear. You stand remarkably still, my heart, bright figurehead gauging the winds? I turned into him, seeking those piercing eyes that already stripped me soul bare tonight. Just resting in my dearest companion and all we've accomplished together, Jack. My frank response held raw conviction. Jack made to deflect the praise, but confession compelled finally burst forth. Without you, I could not have found courage to speak at all. You are my mainstay in ways I barely comprehend myself. I hesitated, Nigel's sly remarks still gnawing at me. Jack, what Nigel implied about smuggled cargo surely there is no truth to such rumors. I asked softly. Jack sighed, his expression turning serious. I run an honest operation Alice. But I'll admit during lean times I have transported some unofficial goods to help ends meet for me and my men. He searched my gaze. Never anything dangerous, just avoiding unnecessary taxes and tariffs. I take no pleasure in deception, but a captain has duties to the crew. I nodded slowly, believing yet disliking his confession. The potential risk bothered my soul. I understand such difficult choices, though I wish no harm comes to you from such tricky tides, I admitted. Jack stroked my cheek, gently. You have my word, days of daring night runs are done. Current winds blow favorable, brightening our shared course ahead. I smiled up at him, trusting his promise and the steadfastness in his warm gray eyes, completely. My voice failed as the enormity of this trust washed over me. I had learned through much trial and error to safeguard myself from men and their attempts to take advantage of an orphaned woman running her own business. None of that existed between Jack and I and it knocked my words away leaving me at a loss. Jack did not need my words for he could see the love and trust in my gaze. He cradled my jaw reverently, wrought emotion waiting his gravelly vow. You leave me humbled beyond measure starlight, and more devoted than ever to remaining worthy of such blinding faith. The shadows hid us from curious eyes, and I allowed Jack to steal a kiss, and then, much to his delight, I stole one of my own. We'd made a statement tonight, as a couple. An engagement would not take anyone in attendance by surprise. Still, it was the change within my own heart that had me giddy. I put off worrying about what could follow this evening and be in this moment where love was thick enough to make one drunk. Chapter 6 I hummed lightly to myself as I reshelved books in my cozy bookshop, replaying Jack's goodbye kiss in my mind. His parting embrace had warmed me for the past two days since his ship set sail. I smiled as I recalled the tenderness in his eyes before duty called him back to sea. The cheerful ringing of the shop doorbell drew me from my pleasant memories. I turned to see Tabitha rush in, her face even paler than usual beneath her flaming curls. Despite her obvious exertion, a chilling dread emanated from her. Alice. She gasped. I just heard from my students, Jack's ship is feared lost off Sable Island on its way home. No survivors expected. Her dire news pierced my heart like an icy knife. The book I held slipped from my numb fingers as I sank to the floor. A sharp cry tore from my throat as Tabitha swiftly knelt to wrap me in her arms. Tears blurred my vision as she rocked me gently, offering what little comfort she could. But no words could console the raw grief, now threatening to swallow me whole. My world crumbled to ruins in mere moments, leaving me adrift in agonized darkness. Her voice faded to meaningless buzzing as the teeming shop tilted dangerously around me. No, surely fate could not be so cruel as to bring Jack into my yearning arms just to tear him screaming away into the frozen abyss. 
I staggered as Tabitha guided us both clumsily to sit while the worst panic stormed through in heaving gusts. Gradually her crooning and tight clasp slowed my jagged breaths. Coherent thought remained impossible, but animal reflex took over propelling me out the door into the rusty dusk. Sable Island was not far from our harbor. Jack had been so close. The biting harbor air slapped me fully alert as we hastened downhill. I must get to the boatmasters, must hear the definitive word myself of Jack's cruel end so far from my anchoring arms. Spectral visions of tangled wreckage and lifeless forms capsizing through dark torrents spurred my stumbling rush past startled villagers. Tabitha clung faithfully to my side, buffering curious bystanders and guiding our grim trajectory down familiar crooked lanes. Rounding the last corner breathless, I glimpsed several cutters converging back towards home waters, flying all flags at grim half-mast. Heart seizing, I cried out stumbling faster now towards concrete truth beyond dreaded imagination. Just then shouts sound from the gathered quay throng parting brisk waves of movement through their midst. Suddenly Jack stood weary and miraculously whole, striding up the slick cobblestones towards me. Shock rooting us both briefly until I threw arms around him sobbing incoherently in his sheltering embrace. For endless moments nothing existed except affirming the reality of his beloved form solid against me. Jack smoothed desperate hands through my tangled hair murmuring blessings and comfort. I clung shamelessly, no one would judge me for this indiscretion in the streets. I needed only to drown in his familiar scent and the hammering proof of his heart still courageously beating. Eventually, some semblance of composure returned along with awareness that we couldn't remain oblivious forever to crowds and duties around us. Tabitha hugged me again. I have to return to the school. Will you be all right? I nodded, not wanting to take my eyes off my man, whole and strong, though shaken by his dance with death. As long as he is here. She smiled knowingly and then made her way back to her waiting pupils who would want word of their fathers. As rescue crews unload exhausted men from various ships, Jack began relating fragmented accounts of spectacular destruction and loss aboard his beloved storm chaser. Though he bore no blame in the savage squall's assault, I glimpsed haunting shadows in his gaze reflecting the harrowing costs paid to escape icy Davy Jones' merciless claws. After submitting the necessary reports, Jack finally turned fully back to me, no barriers clouding the naked need pooling in his blue stare. Without words, I wrap his sinewy frame tight against lingering shocks, and we slowly climb up twisting lanes towards warmth, privacy and comfort sorely needed. In silent agreement, I slipped my hand into the crook of his arm, holding him up as much as he held me, and we made our way to my shop where the warm stove greeted us. Jack shucked his captain's jacket and I hung it on a chair to dry. It would need washing, but one of his crew would see to that later. He was salty and dirty. I pushed him up the stairs to my small apartment, a place he had never tread before. He stood in the middle of the kitchen, taking in my table for two. His fingers graced the pages of the book I'd been reading, left open. I believe I have some, I trailed off as I opened the crate where I'd stored father's belongings, things I couldn't bear to part with yet had no use for. A moment later I found a pair of pants and a loose-fitting shirt. These should work. I nodded toward the tub. If you'll drop your clothing outside the door, I'll rinse them out and hang them to dry. He nodded numbly. I worried about his mental state. Though all his men were accounted for, a fact I was certain was due to his personal diligence, the ordeal had shaken him. I stepped in front of him and cupped his cold cheek. He grasped my hand and leaned into the contact, humming softly. Is this heaven my love? I smiled. It is for me, Jack. Our eyes met and a hunger for life burst through him. He snatched me close and claimed my lips, his tongue dancing across mine in a tango of desire. I press fervent lips against Jack's, needing to bless every scar and daily proof of this steadfast heart still beating for me alone. He clung fiercely in return until sorrow ebbed, peaceful silence wrapping us closer than any earthly vows. Tearing his lips from mine, he did not release me. Our breaths came in a gulping rhythm. Jack, I whispered in surprise. My apologies Starlight. I had to know you were real. He pressed his forehead against mine. I'm real enough to reprimand you for impropriety. 
I sighed against him. Though that kiss seems to have rendered me skullless. A smile hinted at the corner of his lips. I. And I'm right glad for it. He kissed my forehead. I love you, Starlight. I gasped, my heart suddenly overflowing. I had longed to hear those words from his lips. Meeting his intense gaze, I whispered, and I love you, my dear Jack. I tenderly cradled his face in my hands. I have for quite some time now. I drew him to me for another passionate kiss, hoping to convey all the love and devotion I felt for this man. For this moment, nothing else mattered but the two of us confessing our hearts. Perhaps it took almost losing one another to pry the words from our souls, for that reason and that reason alone, I'd be grateful for the sea and her every present danger. Jack was my lifeblood and my soul belonged to him. Chapter 7 the evening shadows stretched long as I finally locked seaside pages after a delayed shipment arrived just before closing. I decided a seaside stroll would cleanse my mind after the chaotic day. The briny breeze kissed my cheeks as I wandered, thinking of nothing in particular and everything at once. I spied Nigel and his unsavory group of friends ahead of me on the path and quickly ducked into a narrow alley I'd never dared explore. Nigel had turned from open admiration to sneers and taunted everything from my mode of dress to my bookish ways. My skin tightened in fear of what the group of unruly men would do if they caught me alone out here. I should have known better than to walk the pier at this time of night but Jack's love and continual presence in my life had emboldened me. The alley smelled sharply of stale spirits and old fish as I picked my way carefully over loose cobblestones. The sound of water echoed softly from the other end and I intended to pop out there and pick my way up the shore toward warm home fires. Muffled voices drifted from the dark end of the sea, one achingly, beautifully familiar. Jack. My whole self yearned to be near him and my heart quickened as I crept further and discovered the alley open to a secluded pier. The men wore rough breeches and stained shirts. They weren't Jack's regular crew and I hesitated making myself known. Crouching behind stacked crates, I saw my beloved Jack in tense exchange with two roughly garbed men offloading barrels from his storm-beaten sloop to a wagon. The men worked quickly under concealing tarps as Jack scanned the harbor warily. Hurry it up, lads, Jack urged tersely. We've little time before the patrol comes through. If you're going to captain a ship for us, you'll need stronger nerves, Jack. I've enough nerve to get your cargo to shore. Tis not the harbor master we fear, tis the pirates that patrol the waters. I've never met a pirate I can't best, Jack's deep voice was full of confidence. The wagon moved off, silent. They must have muffled the wheels to make it so. Coins clinked together and Jack deftly hid a leather purse within his blue captain's coat. Before I could decide whether to reveal myself, Jack perked up as though he'd heard a noise. Silence, he hissed. The two men who hung back melted swiftly into the shadows as Jack turned to greet the officers with forced casualness. Evening officers, he called out. Just making some minor repairs after yesterday's storm. He nudged a loose board and then took its measure with a piece of rope. He took a pencil from behind his ear and made a note right there on the wood. Repairs at dusk in a hidden cove, the head officer questioned sharply. Seems highly suspicious activity from where we sit. I meant no harm, Jack replied lightly, though tension rang in his voice. A man's got to make a living, after all. Especially a man with a lady bookshop owner to keep? The patrolman teased. Women tend to be expensive. Jack chuckled. I. I bristled. I maintained my own living and had never asked Jack for so much as a coin. The guard searched the sloop and pier thoroughly but finally withdrew, failing to uncover the hidden contraband. Once they faded from view, Jack visibly relaxed and climbed aboard his sloop alone, weary but free. With strong strokes, he rode into the night. The loss of his ship weighed heavily upon his mind. Most of his men had found work on other crews or in town. He was a captain without a way to sea and I could tell that part of him was lost because of it. But to turn to smuggling? Was he that desperate? 
I made my way back to the bookshop on unsteady legs, letting myself inside with a shaky sigh. Jack and I had no plans tonight, but he would come to share a meal around midday. Sleep evaded me as I lay restless amidst tangled sheets. My mind spun in endless circles, dreading unknown consequences of Jack's defiant lawlessness down in that hidden cove. Could continuing to love this reckless, effortlessly charming rogue prove anything but utter ruination? The patrol was clearly suspicious, and Nigel and his despicable friends saw far too much in their constant prowling of the docks. Yet even considering casting self-assured, gentle-hearted Jack from my anxious heart now seemed equally unendurable. My soul felt inextricably entwined with his, despite our vastly divergent lives. So I fought valiantly to slow my racing thoughts and act casual when Jack arrived the next day, whistling cheerfully. We'd eat by the bay window overlooking the harbor and I'd be close if a patron came to browse. He laid his charts and navigation tools on the table as I scooped soup into large bowls and retrieved a plate of bread and cheese from upstairs. What's all this for? I asked as I arranged food around his project. Apologies lass, but I'm going away unexpectedly on a brief venture. Wind's willing, I'll return swiftly. I hesitated, anxiety sharpening my tone. Rather sudden mysterious voyage captain. Might I know its nature at least? Jack startled and then resumed his casual nature. Best leave it Alice. I'm chasing a promising business prospect, albeit one navigating grey legal territory. He paused. But a bookkeeper knows realms exist where pragmatism outweighs harsh reality. Yes. My answering frustration sparked a sharp retort. While defiance carries superficial appeal, flouting wisdom often proves one's undoing. I pushed my bowl away, no longer hungry. Silence fell between us as Jack considered me. Very well. I've been hired to captain a ship. My thoughts danced across the implications. Everything that came through was shadowed in that alley. A ship that's full of cargo a pirate may want? I ventured. He laughed. Pirates want every type of cargo. I stared at the map, unable to tell him what I'd overheard and seen. I didn't want to believe him to be a thief or a pirate, but his actions were dangerous. I thought nearly facing death would have made you more cautious, Jack. Old fears, born from the death of my father, threatened to break free. He smiled. Tis not death that motivates me, but love. My eyes jumped to his warm blue gaze. I do not need anything from you Jack. I have a place to sleep and food to eat. My hand waved over the table. I'd prefer you to any of that. I'd live under the pier if it meant we could be together. He stood, taking my hand and brushing his thumb over my ring finger. I'll never ask that of you Starlight. I wouldn't be any kind of a man if I did. He kissed my cheek and then my neck, tickling me relentlessly with his beard. Thank you for lunch. But you didn't eat anything. I exclaimed, jumping to my feet. I broke off a hunk of cheese and dropped it into the bowl along with a piece of bread. Here, take it with you. I pushed it into his chest so he had no choice but to accept the offering. He kissed me lightly, drawing strength from me. Shocked that my captain needed strength, I wasn't able to think clearly until he was at the door. Jack. I called after him. He paused, turning. Yes, Starlight? Please be careful. I didn't know what his errand was or why he felt inclined to take such a risk, but I needed him to return home to me. Fair winds and full sails, my love. With a touch to the brim of his hat, he was out the door and I was left with a pit of worry in my stomach. Chapter 8 the fading afternoon light filtered softly through the bookshop's front window as Tabitha and I sat down to tea at the worn table I used for reading and recording keeping. That new headmaster at the school is absolutely infuriating. Tabitha huffed, blowing an errant strand of chestnut hair off her forehead. He sweeps in, issuing all these demands and procedural changes without consulting me. As if I haven't been teaching for seven years already. I hid a smile at my dearest friend's irritation and refilled our floral-patterned teacups. 
he sounds quite overbearing. Is he at least elderly and stooped to match such a disposition? Tabitha snorted in a most unladylike fashion, popping a bite of scone into her mouth. If only. No, the horrible man has the audacity to be handsome too. As if any gentleman has the right to be so vexing and yet so pleasing to the eyes at the same time. It's most inconsiderate, I say. I couldn't restrain my laughter any more at her indignation. We dissolved into easy giggles, the kind only closest friends can share. Gradually our mirth subsided, and I found myself pensively tracing the grain of the wooden table. Noticing the shift in my mood Tabitha reached over and grasped my hand. You cannot lose faith, dearest. Jack will return to you. Men like him always follow their own stars and weather whatever storms cross their path. I clung to her kind words, tamping down the ache of missing my beloved Jack. I do hope you're right, Tabby. This questionable voyage troubles me so, but I know in my soul he had to go, to find that freedom again after losing his ship so cruelly. Tabitha squeezed my hand tightly, emerald eyes radiating optimism. Keep your chin up Alice. Have courage and believe in love, the kind that endures all separations. Your story isn't over yet, my friend. I smiled gratefully, sheltering the fragile flame of hope her unwavering friendship nurtured in my heart. Jack would come back to me. I had to keep believing it. Mrs. Buckland appeared, her breath labored. Alice, she called to the rafters. I rolled my eyes at Tabitha who hid her giggles behind her teacup. I'm here. I replied half as loudly. What is the emergency? Mrs. Buckland dabbed an embroidered handkerchief at her forehead and then her neck. My mother-in-law is coming for a visit and I have nothing to keep her occupied. Mrs. Buckland Sr. is quite the reader, if I remember. I tapped my chin, all innocence, despite the obvious jest at her mother-in-law's age. Now, Mrs. Buckland the younger, you had better believe that I have just the thing for her. Mrs. Buckland standing in front of me grinned. Alice you are a treasure. I hope marriage does not take you away from shopkeeping. I don't know what I would do without you and Nigel is not at all an understanding soul. Nigel? I asked incredulously. Yes. He's been telling the whole town that he's buying the shop. She tucked her handkerchief into the bosom of her dress. I scoffed. I'd rather see it move to Atlantis than trust this place to the likes of Nigel. My dear, you can't possibly consider running a shop as a married woman, Mrs. Buckland asked aghast. It's unseemly. No more unseemly than the women who run pubs while their husbands are at sea, Tabitha replied with a smile. It may not have been done before, but there's no reason Alice couldn't be the first to do so now. I grinned at my best friend and compatriot. Besides. I held up my bare left hand. Jack and I aren't even engaged. Mrs. Buckland tisked her tongue. Tis only a matter of time. She waved off my words. Please show me this book that will occupy my mother-in-law while she is in my house. Perhaps one that will make her want to lock herself away for several days. Alice suppressed her grin. Of course. This way. As she talked Mrs. Buckland through the plot of several novels, including Persuasion by Jane Austen published posthumously, the understanding that I was the talk of the town simmered in the back of my mind. Not only was Nigel stirring up rumors, but ladies had probably placed very ladylike bets on how soon Jack would propose. They didn't understand that without his ship, he didn't have an income. Perhaps taking this small commission was his way of getting back on top of things. Though I did not expect an engagement before he acquired a new ship of his own. He'd said as much when he began consorting with smugglers. They didn't understand that without his ship, he had no income for a family. Perhaps this questionable smuggling venture was his way of rebuilding lost fortune. Though I did not expect an engagement before he acquired a new ship of his own. He'd said as much when he began consorting with those shadowy men. I could only hope Jack's reckless ambitions did not end up costing far more than he or I were prepared to pay. But I staunchly ignored the dark whispers in my mind. Jack would return safely, and in time, we would finally have the future we both desired. 
I had to keep believing it, no matter what storm clouds gathered on the horizon. Chapter 9 Two mornings later, ominous dread spiked my pulse as I stood at the bookshop window awaiting Jack's return. His ship sailed in. It would be hours before he was free from his duties as captain to come to my open arms. I busied myself as best I could, even trying to lose myself in the fantastic world of Jules Verne's 20,000 leagues under the sea, to no avail. Nothing within those pages could compete with the anticipation of seeing Jack. I glanced up from the thick pages to see a broad-shouldered figure slowly making his way along the street. My eyes refused to believe this was Jack, though the captain's coat slung about his shoulders was a dead giveaway. He appeared largely intact, though a clean bandage around his skull and a sling supporting his left arm revealed overt damage. Dark lashes fanned his weathered skin where it seemed drained of customary vitality. One broad hand lay fragile over his breast. Hesitant relief thawed paralyzed limbs, and I rushed to Jack's side, taking his right hand in my own and supporting him the rest of the way to my shop. Faint warmth there kindled hope within. Unchecked tears blessed our joined flesh as I pressed our hands to my face. Slowly, painfully, bruised eyes focused on me and softened. Cracked lips echoed tenderly. Now lass, what weeping when I'm here, restored as promised? His labored quip broke the floodgates. Anguished laughter spilled past my tears. Only my reckless love might make light of this. Didn't I warn against flouting the sea and law so casually? Jack sank wearily into the chair by the stove, battered face etched with regret. Played the fool indeed. But no harm seemed likely when we agreed to the venture. He related the terrifying battle with vicious pirates who attacked in the night. His crew fought bravely, but the pirates had the advantage of surprise. Jack sustained a blow to the head trying to rally his men, and a slash to his sword arm battling the pirate captain one-on-one -on -one before finally besting him. I feared the worst when the doctor insisted on stitches. Jack indicated the bandage at his hairline ruefully. And my arm will be bound for several weeks. He gazed at me with turmoil in his azure eyes. I wonder if I shouldn't give up the sailing life entirely and take a clerk's position somewhere. My throat tightened at the lifeless thought of my beloved Jack chained to a tiny desk, the freedom of the sea forever lost to him. I gripped his hand fiercely. While I wish no more harm upon you, I could not bear to see your adventurous soul thus caged. You were born to sail, dearest one, as I was born to gather tales bound in leather and cloth. Lifting his battered knuckles to my lips, I whispered fervently, we will face whatever comes together. Jack searched my face, a hint of his roguish smile returning. And if the fear still haunts your bonny eyes each time I sail away again? I stroked back a wayward auburn lock, my heart overflowing with devotion. Then I shall master it out of true love for the man before me now. Take care, but never forget who you were fashioned to be, my own true captain. His answering kiss held all the sweetness of coming home after endless desolate nights watching for a lone ship on the distant horizon. When we finally drifted apart, Jack withdrew something shyly from his coat pocket, taking both my ink-stained hands gently between his weathered pair. We found a safe harbor together through life's most tempestuous squalls when all logic argued against it. Would you now consent to chart the remaining passage as my wife instead? To make this haven home together, no matter where the tides may carry us? Nestled in his palm lay two plain bands wrought of sailor's twine, with a single lustrous pearl knotted intricately into each humble circle. Unfortunately, my wretched circumstances supply no proper gold bands to seal such wondrous vows. I silenced him with slow, salt-laced kisses, blindly holding the dear face I now knew as intimately as my own. I would proudly wear sailor's twine itself, knowing the treasure it signifies, dearest one. Joyful tears blurred my vision, emotion swelling dizzy and wild within. Jack murmured tender nonsense under his breath, rough voice and endless poem to coming days together. And no sweeter sound ever graced my ears than that of my soon-to-be husband painting vivid vistas yet awaiting us just beyond the horizon. Chapter 10 Stirring sounded beyond the waiting chamber, before Tabitha entered, chestnut curls peeking from beneath her floral wreath. Oh, Alice! Don't you make the loveliest bride? She grasped my hands, green eyes brimming warmth. 
Can you believe the long-awaited day is finally here? I blinked back happy tears, smiling tremulously. I confess it all feels rather like a dream. But I'm more than ready to officially tie my life to Jack's and sail wherever fate guides us together. Tabitha's expression softened further. Yet there is also sadness dimming your radiant joy. I sighed, my transient melancholy escaping no one. If only father were still here to proudly walk me down the aisle. But. I rallied with a brighter look. In my heart, I know he would have approved of my rugged captain after witnessing the rightness between us. We embraced tightly. As we separated, Tabitha helped align my lace train. I gathered the filmy material in one hand and we moved toward the chamber door together. Beyond lay cozy chairs circled round potted palms and strings of painted buoys. Sweet floral garlands adorned every surface as guests mingled in anticipation. My breath caught at the loving hospitality of our little coastal community. Truly no better place existed to launch this new chapter, surrounded by kindred spirits. Now more eager than ever, I stepped into the quaint room with Tabitha, ready to join my destiny. Cerulean eyes blazed only for me while we drew closer through timeless moments. This walk symbolized our longer journey navigating from strangers to tested commitment between twin flames now sealing joyously before heaven's emissary. Jack's soundless endearment was meant for no other incarnation of this scene entirely, only the woman poised to become his solace and safe harbor henceforth. Such adoration outshone any lighthouse beacon guiding my course unerringly to his waiting arms at long last. At the flowered altar, I placed my hand in Jack's strong clasp with a misty smile. The pastor intoned timeless vows binding our lives as one while I read solemn wonder flooding Jack's beloved features mirroring my own stunned delight to stand soul to soul fully revealed. Two separate streams merged eternal now in sacred covenant. When pronounced man and wife, Jack cradled my face between his calloused yet gentle palms. Heartbeats stretched endless until he solemnly sealed the promises death alone might sever with a searing kiss. Rapturous applause erupted but I heard only my steadfast sailor's joyous laughter drawing me close as we spun giddy circles, vaulted beams blessing traditions reforged anew. Scooping me up, Jack carried me from the soaring tower toward our bookish sanctuary. Yet halfway there he paused, azure gaze glinting with boyish excitement. A slight change of course, my heart's safe harbor. He turned us instead toward the bustling docks, where a magnificent three-masted clipper ship loomed, early moonlight playing tag across her proud lines. My lips parted in awe as Jack set me down before the striking vision. She's the granule, he explained, hand spanning my hips from behind. And her owners hired me as captain for her maiden voyage to New York on the morning tide. His voice softened against my ear. They've granted us the fine lady this night to celebrate our union. I whirled in his embrace, joy spilling unrestrained. Oh, Jack. Did I not foretell you would helm your own proud vessel again one day? Drawing me aboard, his answering grin glowed bright. I, though we'll be making port here often, so I needn't overlong bear separation from my beautiful starkeeper. We stood entwined as one on the polished deck. Jack's thumbs traced my cheeks, sea blue eyes like moonlit water. No sonnet conveys the magnificent spell you cast on me today, my darling girl. His stroking hands gentled wedding night nerves. Against odds, we navigated to anchor blissfully together beyond all storms. I smiled up at him softly. Today, seals victory far sweeter than any siren's dream, my peerless captain. Jack's grin flashed bright where our mouths met in a benedictory kiss. No uncertainty could breach the blissful peace we found here now, anchored fast and glowing bright as the staunch tower still standing through darkness, guarding the sailor's landfall and sweetest homecoming always beside me. We are back. What did you think of Alice and Captain Jack's story? And literally, I just realized that Captain Jack is like the same as Jack Sparrow. And I did not mean to do that when I wrote the story. Please forgive me for that. If I end up putting it on Kindle 
or somewhere else. I will definitely change his name and comment about that, but I just caught it and realized, and I'm sorry, because that was ridiculous. <laughs> Jack's name aside, what did you think about their story, their romance? It's a short story, so there's a lot that's got to happen in a short amount of time. Anyway, I just would love to hear what you think. And also, um, I have Tabitha's story kind of knocking around up here. And I'm just wondering if y'all would like to hear that one too. So let me know in the comments and I look forward to hearing from you. Please remember that you are loved and I will see you on the next video.